Good afternoon to everyone. I was about to present myself, and I think I will still do, but I think you got the gist of it, because I heard the word Araber and Israeli, and the other words that might refer to my background. So I'll just uh, do it uh, briefly. My name is uh, George Deek. I am the uh, new two months here, the new Israeli Deputy Chief of Mission or Deputy Ambassador. There's no good word for it. I understood in Norwegian, uh, so I don't know. But uh, I arrived here two months ago. I'm uh, 28 years old. This is my second posting. Before coming here, I was uh, working for three years in Nigeria as also Deputy Ambassador at the Israeli Embassy in Abuja. And I arrived here, as I said, uh, two months ago. I am an Israeli Arab. I come from a Palestinian family. A, I'm, I'm a Christian Arab, actually. And uh, the word Deek, my last name Deek, is an Arab word that in Arabic Deek means rooster. So as you can understand from the uh, imagination, I come from a very proud family that gets up very early in the morning. <laughs> so I will talk a little bit uh, about uh, Israel. Because I was told today to speak about the situation. In, uh, you said 45 minutes, but I think uh, it was our 15 minutes actually on the program, but it doesn't matter. And talking about the situation is a bit complicated in Israel because everything in the world is part of the situation. I assume in a few months we'll discover that even the Arctic issues between Norway and Russia are also part of the Israeli situation somehow. So we're waiting to see how that evolves. So uh, I just got a gift from one of the members here, a sevivon, we call it in Hebrew. I don't know how you, you call it in Norwegian. It's the thing you spin on Purim holiday. That thing, whatever he said. And um, I thought maybe I'll just spin it. And wherever it falls, I'll just choose that topic and speak. But uh, I think what I will do is I'll speak a little bit about each topic that I've brought with me. And I'll really do it short, and then we'll bring uh, uh, some uh, questions and answers. So we'll see what's interesting for you, and then I can comment about uh, those topics. But before talking about the topics itself, it's important to say a few words about Israel that we all know, but we all sometimes tend to forget about the miracle called the State of Israel. Israel is 64 years old. It's a country of immigrants, mostly. I'm not an immigrant, but most people there are immigrants. Three million people immigrated to Israel, half of the population along the years. And yet in 60 years, we have created one of the nations that is contributing to the being, to the well-being, to the welfare of the world. At, at, if not the first, then among the first nations. We're speaking about agriculture, I've been in Nigeria for three years. I've seen Israeli drip irrigation systems saving the lives of people there who cannot uh, uh, have crops during the dry seasons because they don't have water. Their irrigation is based on rain, on flood irrigation it's called. What, the rain comes and it floods the fields and that's how they irrigate. We presented irrigation system. I was in one project in the city of Mina, in, uh, very close to Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. And in MENA, the embassy donated 25 irrigation systems. Each one of them is for one hectare. And thanks to this irrigation system, people who had literally nothing to eat during the dry season, which is six months, half of the year, now they have tomatoes, they have cucumbers, they have melons, they have watermelons, and they have uh, sweet peppers. And it's all thanks to this Israeli technology. It's important to remember that this technology that was invented in Kibbutz Netafim in Israel is part of the revolution of the Israeli uh, uh, agricultural field. Israel does not have natural resources. Uh, we just discovered some gas, but it's, we're not seeing anything from it yet. But we did not have nor diamonds, nor gold, nothing. We only have one resource, which we have to rely on, and it's up here. And that's the only resource that has kept Israel going for 64 years, because without it, we have a country that is 60% uh, arid and another 28% semi-arid. The highest rainfall in Israel 
uh, is in the Golan Heights. This is the place with the highest amount of rain per year. And that's 800 millimeters per, year, per uh, annual rainfall. 800 millimeters. In Nigeria, when I was, I don't know the rainfall here, it's interesting to check. But in Nigeria, the, the, the highest place where they had rainfall was in the south, where they had 4,000 millimeters of, year, of rain a year. And in the north, which they consider dry, a desert, they have 900, which is higher than our highest. And we became a country that is exporting uh, food products. And we have evolved through the time from a country that is exporting apples. And today we are a country that is producing Apple computers. Two months ago, Apple decided to open its first R&D center abroad outside the United States. And they chose to do it in Haifa, in Israel because they know what they can achieve in a country with such a high human cap uh, capacity. The high-tech startup uh, and R&D in general in Israel is leading the world. If you look at the la latest Global Innovation Index, which was published about six, seven weeks ago, you would see that in that uh, uh, Innovation Index, Israel is ranked first in the world in research and development center, first in the world in government investment in research and development per capita, first in the world in human capital, and all that is leading to Israel being a leading country in innovation where you have companies like Google, Apple, Microsoft, Intel working in Israel. Each one of you has a cell phone. I'm sure you all used an SMS. You were just told by your CEO how to send SMS if you don't have Facebook. Well, SMS is an Israeli technology. It was invented by Israel. If you have pictures that you're taking by your phone, putting it on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, etc., the camera on your phone was invented in Israel. If you ever chatted on the computer, if you have ever uh, instant message or Facebook message, etc., instant messaging was invented by, in Israel by a company, Israeli company called ICQ few years back and I think these developments of Israel are important to remember even if we know it and I'm sure you all heard lectures about people talking about the contributions of Israel but when I speak to the about the situation it's going to be very dark so it's important to have this beam of light in our uh, in our mind before we get to the problematic issues like Iran and the, the area Israel was also based on special values which most of the world, the Western world, has learned from and shared. As an immigrating society, it started as a socialist country. You've all known the kibbutz system, you've heard about the moshavs, you've heard about all the uh, uh, social welfare that Israel has lived from for several decades. But from there we have evolved and uh, changed a little bit. And today we have a very good social system, especially in the healthcare, for example. But at the same time, it's a thriving capitalist, in a way, society, where businesses are flourishing. Tel Aviv is ranked one of the best business places in the world. In fact, Tel Aviv is ranked uh, second for the high-tech industry in the world after uh, the uh, Silicon Valley. And we have done that in 64 years, ladies and gentlemen. 64 years. These are the developments in Israel that show that Israel is still and is very, a very good country to live in. But it's also subjective, because if you look at the latest happiness index, which was published two weeks ago, then you would see that uh, the question in, the, in that questionnaire was, uh, how happy are you in your life in the country you're living? Israel was ranked eight in the world. A country surrounded by hundreds of millions of people calling for its destruction every day, a country that is boycotted by many organizations worldwide, a country that is perceived to be racist or to be a, uh, the heart of all the world problems, eight in the world. Norway is higher, but <laughs> we're not doing so bad. Eighth place in the world. And there is a reason to be happy. 
And if you look at the situation of the minorities in Israel, I come from one, I par I'm part of the Arab minority. The situation of the Arab minority in Israel, I'm gonna make a bold statement, but I can back it with facts. The situation of the Arab minority in Israel is the best situation of any Arab group or population, not just in the Middle East, in the world. And I'm not saying this because it's uh, something nice to say. I have gathered information and data that shows that the level of education, the level of income and GDP, and the level of, uh, the low level of violence, all those integrations and many others, show that the situation, in fact, if you are Arab, unless you are a, a son of a sheikh or an emir in the Gulf, the best place to be born is in Israel, as an Arab. Even better than the situation of other minorities in uh, Europe or in the United States. And you can see this also for, with the uh, treatment of Christians like me or others who live in Israel. The only place in the Middle East today that the number of Christians is increasing in Israel. The number of Christians uh, in Israel has increased uh, 400 Arab Christians, 400%. The number of total Christians by over 1,000% uh, during the existence of Israel until today. You look around us, what is happening in the Arab world. The situation of the Copts in Egypt. In Gaza, in Gaza, 4,500 until, f between 4,005 to 5,000 Christians lived in Gaza in the year 2005. Today, less than 1,500. They have all fled from Gaza, from free will, from persecution. They're all out of there. In fact, there were riots against Christians uh, lately because uh, two um, Christians were forcefully um, converted to Islam. So for the first time in history, the Christian minority in Gaza went out and protested against the Hamas uh, regime. As a result of that, the uh, Mutran, the um, bishop of the Christian community there was beaten and hospitalized. And that's the situation. But I'm glad to see that today the world is slowly awakening. In fact, if you read the, the editorial of Vege yesterday, you would see that the editorial of Vege here in Norway is talking about uh, how important it is for the Norwegian government to reach out and uh, uh, protest against the situation of Christians in the Arab world. You'll see there that they are saying that, uh, and I will talk about the protests that we're seeing about the movie, but they're saying that while it's okay and it's good to protest uh, uh, as part of this free speech against a, a an insulting movie towards your religion, it's also important to come out and to uh, defend the right of other religious minorities in the Arab world. And that is something that we have seen positive approaches today from the Norwegian government as part of a worldwide move to try to better the situation of Christians in the Middle East. And now I want to talk a little bit about the, what is called the situation. So we'll start by uh, Iran. We'll uh, move uh, maybe from there to Syria, Hezbollah, and the Palestinians. And then we'll open the room for questions. So about uh, Iran, I don't know if, have, have you seen the uh, speech of uh, Ahmadinejad in the United Nations or before that in others? I'm sure you've all heard of him, uh, heard him at some occasion. Before we talk about Ahmadinejad, it's important to emphasize that the Iranian population, the Persian population, they're not Arabs, uh, it's always confusing, but they're not Arabs, they're Persians. And the Persian population is the most Israeli-friendly population in the Middle East. I'll give you a nice example from the latest times. There's an Israeli singer called uh, Rita. She's a very famous singer. She's like Madonna of Israel. Very famous, very popular, loved by everyone in the consensus. And originally, she's Iranian. But all her albums until today were made in Hebrew. And now, after, I think, six golden albums in Israel, she decided to do an album in Persian. She loves, she remembers all the childhood songs that her mother used to sing to her before bed or during uh, uh, family times at home. 
and it was in Persian. So she decided to do a modern version of Persian songs that she has uh, learned. She did it. It was a great album, especially if you understand Persian, and I don't. But in Persia, in Iran, it has become one of the greatest hits. It was banned by government, but it was sold underground. And today, almost everyone in Iran who's into music knows who Rita is and have heard a song or two of hers. That's from Iran. This probably is not possible in any Arab country, including the both Arab countries with which we have peace. It shows that the Iranian population has a positive attitude towards Israel. The, it's not just being positive about Israel. The Iranian population is an enlightened population. They are a modern population. They want better lives. They want to have a better future for themselves, for their kids. We have seen this coming out in the protests that took place in 2009 after the elections uh, rigging in Iran. But unfortunately for these people, they are forced to live under a mad dictator's uh, tyrannical regime. They have to live under the rule of, uh, of, I would say, religious extremists, and that's an understatement, that don't see themselves as rulers of a population that should, should uh, improve the situation of their society, but rather the messengers of an apocalyptic message came to bring the second imam, which is the, uh, not the second, the twelfth imam, which is according to the Shiite uh, faith, is coming to redeem the world. And they believe it will only happen after this apocalyptic war between the forces of Islam and Shia Islam and the rest of the world, the, the kafara, the infidels. You see this today. We have been warning about Iran for 15 years, having nuclear weapons. I don't want you to, to get into the details, you probably have heard it uh, too much already. We've been warning about it for 15 years. Only 10 years ago, the world started taking it seriously. And only four years ago, sorry, only six years ago, the first round of sanctions was imposed on Iran. The sanctions are very effective in the way that they are curbing the Iranian economy. Today, the Iranian currency is in a historic low. The situation in the streets, in the economy is terrible. But the questions remain. Did the sanctions, did the deteriorating situation of Iranians stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapon? Did the sanctions, did the horrific situation of the Iranian population made the Iranian government to say, let's stop the centrifuge and let's focus on the benefit of our society? The answer clearly is no. In fact, since the sanctions became harsher, and since the Iranian population was suffering more, the centrifuge were spinning in a higher pace and more enriched uranium was made. Nobody wants a war. Nobody wants to get to a situation where anyone is dying or when anyone is attacked. This is the last thing we want. But unfortunately, we have a regime that is not working by rational uh, um, 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 logic, but rather by an ideological and irrational and apocalyptic vision. And if you want to understand how dangerous a nuclear Iran is, think about a situation where a country that is sponsoring terrorism worldwide, sending terrorists to Burgas in Bulgaria, attacking Israeli and Bulgarian citizens, sending terrorists to Thailand, to India, and even to Washington to kill a Saudi diplomat. Imagine that country, those terrorists with nuclear backing. Imagine Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hezbollah in the year 2006, when the war against, uh, when the Israeli uh, 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 military uh, did the operation, the Second, world, uh, Leban Second Lebanon War uh, was taking place, Hezbollah had um, 14,000 rockets, all of them short range, all of them south of the Litani River, from which he fired 4,500 rockets during the war in Lebanon. They were all short range. The longest they got, unfortunately, is for Haifa in the north of Israel. Today, ladies and gentlemen, 
Hezbollah has between 60 to 70,000 rockets. And these rockets don't only get to Haifa. These rockets will get to Tel Aviv, and they have rockets who get to Eilat. There is not a single place in Israel that is safe from the rockets of Hezbollah. Imagine them having, whether a nuclear device, or imagine them having a backing of a nuclear country. And I think you've all also heard about the results it will have, a nuclear run would have in the Middle East regarding an arms race. The Bahrain Foreign Affairs, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bahrain, on his Twitter, which now you know what is, he has quoted the Israeli ambassador in Washington who speaks about the danger of a nuclear Iran. I will repeat, the Foreign Minister of Bahrain, with which we have no diplomatic relations, no nothing at all, is quoting publicly in his Twitter account an Israeli ambassador to Washington alarming the world from the dangers of a nuclear Iran. If this doesn't signalize panic and fear from the Gulf countries and the region from a nuclear Iran, I don't know what will. They are quoting us from Bahrain. It's unheard of. A nuclear Iran will bring an arms race, a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Nobody will control that. We're seeing exactly how stable the situation in the Middle East is. You know that nuclear uh, cookies or cakes, I don't know they, how they call them, you can carry them in bags. You can take them from one place to another. Imagine that happening. Imagine that bomb being here in Oslo or in Washington or in Tel Aviv. Such a bomb, a small bomb, can erase two-thirds of Washington and make it inhabitable for hundreds of years. In Oslo, obviously nothing will be left. Tel Aviv, it will reach Ramallah. I'm not here to, to install fear in your hearts, but I'm here because I want you to understand the danger of having a nuclear Iran and why, when everyone is saying that Netanyahu is speaking about it too much, why it's important to tell them that it's not he who is speaking too much, it's the world who is speaking too little about the danger of Iran. And now we get, um, about Syria, I, I wrote down to, write, to speak a little bit about Syria, but I think you had a fascinating lecture by uh, Mr. Uh, Weiner before. So I'll just say that, uh, and I'm not speaking as an Israeli diplomat right now, I'm speaking as a human being, and as an Arab, part of the Arab people. It breaks my heart to see fellow Arabs, to see human beings being butchered by anyone, let alone an Arab leader, in the tens of thousands, and not enough is being done. This person, I don't know, yeah, there was a question before uh, for the previous lecture about Syria, whether Israel prefers to see Assad stay or Israel prefers Assad to go. I personally don't really care what official stands are. I know that this person has lost any legitimacy to rule over his people. He lost any legitimacy to be part of the world as a leader. And he must be stopped in any way possible. And I know that our government is in that position as well. Okay, I would like to move now maybe a little bit about the situation of the Palestinians uh, and uh, rather about the situation of the uh, negotiations, the peace negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. I think, well, it's no secret. Let's not shy away from it. The negotiations are frozen. Nothing is really happening. Uh, there is no progress being made. And I think this is part of a Palestinian strategy uh, 
to go uh, in unilateral moves to stop the negotiations and start working unilaterally, one-sidedly. And I can understand the logic. And I think it's a very clear logic. If you go to negotiations, you have to negotiate. You have to compromise. If I want to have the apples you have and you want the oranges I have, then we'll compromise. We'll reach a situation where you can have half of my oranges and I can have half of your apples and everyone is happy or better everyone is sad that's when you know it was a good negotiation but the Palestinians have probably made a strategic decision they don't want to lose their apples they don't want to recognize a Jewish state of Israel until today I was speaking with my friends back there until today I haven't heard the president of uh, the Palestinian Authority Mahmoud Abbas I haven't heard any Palestinian authority a, a, a supporting a solution of two states for two nations, bless you. Until today, I haven't seen one leader saying two states for two peoples or for two nations. They only talk about two states. Why is it important? When you say two states, you mean a Palestinian state and an Israeli state. But it has nothing to do about the character of the Israeli state or about the future of Palestinian refugees and their so-called right of return. When you say two states for two peoples, then you recognize that there are two peoples in the area who deserve a state. The Palestinian people and the Jewish people. And the lack of willingness by the Palestinian leadership to accept a notion of a Jewish country or of a Jewish state is, uh, is a symbol for their general attitude. And they know that if they go unilaterally, I don't know if you've heard the speech of President uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, of the Palestinians in the UN. I was shocked. It was an incitive speech, blaming Israel in ethnic cleansing, blaming Israel in planning a second uh, Nakba, blaming Israel in trying, in plotting to annihilate uh, or I'm not quoting, but something like getting rid of the Palestinians in the area or at least of their national aspirations. This is incitement. And this is coming one week after Israel saved him from falling by transferring 250 million shekels to the Palestinian Authority as an advance of the taxpayers' money. But they took a strategy. They want to isolate Israel to to start an assault or to continue an assault against Israel in the international scene, delegitimizing, staining it as a pariah state. And therefore, at the end, they can, they hope, bring the international community to force the solution that they want upon the Israelis, which means somehow bringing the Israelis out of the West Bank. And they, 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 they get everything they want. They get a state, they get the whole territory, maybe even East Jerusalem in their dreams, but they don't make any compromise. They don't have to give up the right of refugees to come back to inside Israel, hence destroying the Jewish character of the state. They don't have to make any territorial compromises. They don't have to accept and recognize a Jewish state. You get everything by giving nothing. So I understand the strategy, and that's why we have to make sure we tell them the Palestinians, if you want peace, if you want to reach a real peace, you have to sit down and talk. You need two for, two for tango. Israel cannot do peace with itself. We need a partner to sit down and talk to. And despite our ongoing calls for the Palestinian leadership to sit down on the negotiations table and talk to the Israeli leadership, including a moratorium of 10 months in freezing any activity in the settlements, which they claim is the major obstacle for peace, which is not correct to be uh, very gentle. But even that didn't bring them back to the negotiations table. So I hope from here a message will go out to the leadership of the Palestinian Authority. We need peace in our region. We don't need 
to create a situation where the hatred is higher. We don't need a situation where frustration and anger from one side to another is there. We need to find a, a way where we can sit down together. And now I want to go to the Arab protests and to tie it together to the Palestinian issue. If there is one thing we learn in the Israeli perspective from the Arab Spring, is that when you sign an, an agreement with a leader and not with the people, it's very fragile. Le the leader goes, you have no idea what's going to happen with the agreement. We have uh, uh, the president of Egypt today, uh, Morsi. From the day he took charge in office until today, he has not said the word Israel once. Every time he refers to the peace agreement with Israel, he says, we will, uh, um, we will uh, comply with our international agreements and obligations. That's the code for the peace agreement with Israel. He would never say the word Israel. When he wanted to talk about Israeli occupation in the West Bank at the UN, he said, when one side of the UN is occupying uh, a, a population of etc., etc., he is not willing to say the word Israel. So now I want to put Egypt for, uh, at the side for a minute, but we, saw, we have a peace agreement with Egypt. It's not a hostile country, it's not a, an enemy country. We have an agreement. But how, how is it different, the situation with Egypt, than sometimes with the situation with another Arab country with which we don't have peace? Do Israelis feel safe to go to Cairo and walk in the streets? No. Can Israelis travel freely along Egypt? Can they do business with Egyptians? If you are an Egyptian and you travel to Israel, you might be banned for the rest of your life from the community, from the academics, if you're an academic. Very little there to do so. They will be boycott. And the message we should take from this is that a real peace, a lasting peace in the Middle East can only be a real peace between nations, between peoples. If we want to have peace with the Palestinians, then the Palestinian Authority and Israel has its own challenges in that aspect. We see those thugs, those criminal bullies from the settlements called price tag, tak mechir, going and cutting olive trees of Palestinians or spraying mosques, etc. This is completely unacceptable. These are criminals that we should we put in jail. But I think the same should happen at the Palestinian Authority. People who are inciting, the incitement that is taking place in the teaching books of the Palestinians in schools. This is the real challenge for peace, not the settlements. When you teach hatred for people who live 10 minutes away from you by car, that is the real obstacle for, pe for peace. So I hope next time we have peace negotiations with the Palestinians, with the Syrians, with the Egyptians, it will be a genuine one. A one that will bring real peace between the nations. One that will allow Israeli professors to go and lecture in Palestinian, Egyptian, Syrian universities. Will allow Egyptian sculpturists come and have an exhibition in Tel Aviv. One that will allow students from Damascus to come and have an exchange of students in Natania. That is real peace. Not peace about how many tanks will be at the border. So I hope and I pray that we get to this situation. You know, I personally have a family who lives in the Palestinian Authority. I have family in Ramallah. I have family in Amman. I, I have family in Damascus and other places around the Arab world. I hope I'm not getting them into trouble by saying it. But there's nothing I would like to see more. There's nothing I would like to see more than seeing them flourishing. People in the world have a tendency to see the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians as a football game. If one side scores, the other side lose. It doesn't work like that. I'm representing the state of Israel because I know that in this conflict, when one side scores, both sides win. If Israel is flourishing, the Palestinians will flourish. If the Palestinians are suffering, eventually Israel will suffer too. Either we grow together or we fall together. These are the only two options we have. It's not a game. It's human life. I want my friends and my family in Ramallah 
to have the best life possible, not any least from the one I'm getting as an Israeli citizen in Tel Aviv or in Yaffa or in Jerusalem or in Haifa. They're entitled for it. And we should do our best to help them get it. But we have to be careful that instead of focusing on creating understanding and creating more love between the two peoples, that we don't fall into the same trap and create more hatred and more incitement by attacking one side or by taking ridiculous claims and going one-sidedly against the other side. That is a true recipe for hatred. And to the, I will end my lecture in uh, talking a little bit about the Arab Spring and the protests against the, uh, forgot the name of this ridiculous stupid movie made in the United States attacking the Prophet uh, Muhammad. Um, I believe you've all heard at least once uh, people talking about the Arab Spring. You know, first of all, I'll, I'll, maybe I should say something in a personal perspective. As an Arab, my heart and my chest went like this when I saw the Arab Spring taking place. Everyone was telling us Arabs that we are not Democrats, that we accept tyranny, that we do not understand democracy and human rights. I can fill my chest and say, we have toppled dictators in our world. We have removed the shackles of tyranny in our countries. We are a free people now. And it's true. It fills me with pride and happiness to see what is happening in the Arab world. But we have to be careful. There's always a danger that the Arab Spring could slip and become an Islamic winter. And that danger is very viable, and we have seen it in some places. To remind you, the Islamic Brotherhood in Egypt, who won the elections, did not even participate at the protests at the first few weeks. The people who weren't to the protests were the liberals, who were looking for a better life and more connection to the world. But there's always a chance that the situation will be hijacked by extremists. And that is a process that the Arab world will have to go through and to learn by doing. Make mistakes, fall, rise, rise, fall, fall again, and then rise. And uh, like this Sevivon, uh, hope that they will land on the right side of the box. And it's up to them. And. Uh, about the demonstrations ag against the uh, movie, well, uh, I should start by saying the obvious. The movie is a terrible movie, both by quality and by message. It's disgraceful to attack a religion or a faith or a prophet or a symbol of faith of any other nation or uh, religion. And it's probably better if this movie would have never been created. But nothing at all can justify or even bring an understanding to an attack against embassies, to the murder of an American ambassador who helped free the country where he lives, where he serves. Nothing can justify that kind of violence. And there is a problem. Uh, uh, that free speech and other democratic tools are not fully understood or uh, accepted even. Even when they are understood, they're not always accepted in the uh, Arab world. And again, the protests, and by the way, peaceful protests against the movie, not only it's legitimate, but it's welcomed. Because the only way you can fight hatred is uh, the, a, free, a speech of hatred is by speech of caring and bridge building. And when you go on to these demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations against the movie, and you say, we are against extremism, against any religion, these are protests I would like to take part in against the movie. But freedom of speech, or a, a, the right to be insulted, let's call it, should be valid for everyone. 
the same Arab world, the same streets where people are marching against the movie against Muhammad, are the same streets where newspapers are being delivered. And in those newspapers, you have some of the most anti-Semitic, some of the most West US Israel hating caricatures that you can imagine. If you go in Ramadan to the Arab world during the month of Ramadan, there is a, a, a tradition of having a movie during a series during the Ramadan time, 30 uh, days, 30 episodes. Um, you know, a telenovela, like they call it in, uh, in, uh, in the Latin world. But if you look at the last few years, all the series in during Ramadan are attacking Jews in one way or another. Where were the demonstrations then? Or is it only Muslims that have the right to be insulted? We should all care about each other's faith. But I have seen also a positive aspect, which made me also optimistic about the latest uh, demonstrations. You know, as an Arab, I can read Arabic. And I see a little bit of the Arab media uh, being published in Egypt, the Laharam newspaper, etc. And I think, as part of the struggle for democracy and a better future in the Arab world, these demonstrations are part of it. And the latest uh, um, uh, writings op-eds, uh, editorials, or letters. And uh, we've seen a couple, I think about five or six, in El Ahram newspaper. In, um, I forgot some other more. I have a list somewhere, I made a list. And they're all talking about, we are attacking the West. We're talking against the United States, blaming the whole country for a movie made by uh, originally an Egyptian copt uh, citizen who lives in the United States. Yet the cards we use are made in the West. The computers we use are made in the West. The clothes we wear are designed in the West. Everything we have. So we are consuming from that culture, but we are not finding a path to live with it in a coexistence. And when it comes from Arab writers in the, in the mainstream media, in the Arab world, it has a huge significance. Because for the first time, and this, is, this was my hope during the Arab Spring, and I see it coming out now in these writings. For the first time, you see self-criticism in the Arab world. And that's something that almost did not exist before, at least not in mainstream media. You would see it in some publications of uh, people on the uh, margins of the Arab society. But in mainstream media, criticizing the Arab world itself by the Arabs, almost, almost unheard of. And this is my hope. And today we are, uh, the uh, Jewish people just celebrated the New Year and Yom Kippur. I want to take this hope uh, of starting each one of us looking at our own mistakes and seeing how we can bring a better world to this, uh, to this place where we live the Middle East, Europe, the United States, the Arab world, Africa, etc. We owe it to ourselves and to the next generations that, and the Arabs owe it to themselves and the next generations that what happened in the last two, three years will bring hope, will bring freedom, and will bring a better life for people who live there. And we will be the first and we, we will be, in Israel, we will be the happiest to finally stop saying we are the only democracy in the Middle East. We will be more than happy to give up that uh, title. And with that hope, I want to say thank you very much and open the room for questions.